Hello, everyone. I am so sorry for uh, the delay in getting started. Uh, we had a little bit of a technical difficulty, but we're here now and super excited for this autism webinar, Diversity of the uh, um, Autistic Brain from Genes to Brains to Interventions and Lived Perspectives. My name is Matthew Lay, and as always, I will be your host. I want to start off by saying that opinions that are reflected in this workshop are those of the speakers, the presenters, myself, and do not necessarily reflect Autism Ontario's views. Please note that Autism Ontario does not endorse any specific therapy, product, treatment, strategy, opinion, service, or individual. We do, however, endorse your right to information, and that's what these are all about. Autism Ontario strongly believes that it's important to do your own research and make your own informed decisions. I also want to review the use of language during this presentation. Autism means something different to everyone. Medical professionals, researchers, and providers may use one term. An individual or, or their family may refer to themselves or their family member differently. The different terms you'll hear used to describe autism are either uh, person first effective, person with autism, or an identity, identity first label. Um, example, autistic person. Person first language reflects the idea that autism can be separated from uh, from a person and doesn't define them, similar to the phrases such as living with autism. Well, identity first language reflects the belief that being autistic is an important part of a person's identity and cannot be separated. To respect both these preferences, um, I and we will be using both terms interchangeably throughout the workshop and will respect any label that you personally choose as well. All right, I try to get that done as quickly as possible. So I could introduce our our, our speaker today, who um, who uh, hopefully you're not having too stressful of of a morning, doctor. Um, but Doctor Ivadokia Agnosto, and we're going to be discussing some very very um, very uh, exciting research. So welcome to the uh, to the table, Doctor. Um, I've uh, connected you in. Um, unfortunately, um, not on uh, on on video today. Um, and how I'd like to start the conversation is is simply ask, um, you know, why is this topic important? Uh, as well as, um, you know, what do you hope our audience takes away from it uh, as we as we go through it today? Um, thank you, thank you uh, for for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry, everybody. The hospital firewall is blocking me from acting. Um, you may even hear them trying to like join right now, but I'm gonna ignore them so we can actually get to the presentation. But um, the topic. So I was asked to to talk to you a little bit about this because I presented to the International Society of Autism Research this year some of our work that explores the different versions of autism from biology to behavior to response to treatment. And um, uh, Autism Ontario, who is our partner in our research uh, work, was there. And they thought it would be important for parents and clinicians to um, have an updated view of how we think about the many different types of autism the many different types of trajectories that the kids get and what the overlap of autism with other neurodevelopmental conditions um, seems to be because the, for the families in the audience, the, the kids as they grow up, um, it becomes very clear to parents that one size does not fit all and it's extremely important for our governments and our policymakers to understand that um, one size does not fit all because we are having more and more data that would suggest that we are talking about different conditions that just share um, some features like difficulties with social interaction and repetitive behaviors. So understanding that the label itself is not predicting for your child or for your patient or for yourself what the trajectory, what the expected outcomes would be, what the needs would be, and what the potential intervention should be 
is where we're at now. And of course, it's not a comfortable space. It's nicer when we, we can use labels to predict, but right now um, the evidence would suggest that we can't. And so I'll show you uh, where we are with research in terms of this diversity of um, clinical presentations, experiences, brains, bodies, genomics um, of, uh, uh, within the autism spectrum <clears throat> to make the case for why we need to understand the condition that every child has beyond the labels, although the labels can be useful sometimes to get access to resources and so on. So I hope that's help helpful as an introduction. And given we are, that we are a bit late, I'm happy to get started if that's okay. Excellent. So, so what I'm going to do for our audience is just, <coughs> excuse me, let them know that they can continue to submit their questions. We did get started late and we got a lot of content to get through. So we're going to dive right into the presentation. Um, we are currently on slide three, diversity in clinical um, presentations. And so um, as you go through your presentation, doctor, just say next slide and I'll make sure that we move to the next next slide. And I'll come back in a bit with some questions from, from our audience. But for now, over to you. Perfect. Okay. So slide B is about um, uh, thinking through all the different experiences of autism we have. So the manuals, the books will tell us that autism is a, is a condition, but it's a combination of uh, social communication deficits or differences depending on your perspective and repetitive behaviors. But what I typically tell my patients and my trainees and my colleagues and the families is that nature doesn't read our manuals. <laughs> and just because we decided at some point that autism is just a combination of social communication differences and repetitive behavior doesn't mean that, that that's what it is. In fact, we know that as the kids who get a, an autism diagnosis grow up, they start accumulating a variety of um, different diagnoses. So we know, for example, that between 30 and 50% of kids with autism at some point actually do meet criteria for uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, or we know that the rates of obsessive compulsive disorder are much higher in kids who have autism and youth that, that identify as autistic than um, people who um, in the general population. We know that kids go to clinic and ask for help for things like anxiety and depression, irritability and aggression. We know that the rates of epilepsy in this population for us is at least 10 times that of the general population. We know that lots of kids have motor difficulties, including coordination and planning difficulties, although they're not part of the diagnostic criteria. We know that they often present with other physical symptoms like um, gastrointestinal distress, severe constipation and reflux, uh, severe sleep disturbance. We know that we find immune differences uh, in many of the kids. So what does that mean for our definition of autism? So if you have a condition, um, if we have a condition that is predicting that as the kids will grow up, they will accumulate differences in other symptom domains that have nothing to do with the definition, um, but they're predicted to get that, and that the vast majority of kids with who identify as autistic as they grow will get other diagnoses, then is it possible that the actual categories, the actual groupings uh, of kids with the, of, the ver of the different versions of autism um, are actually not specific to social communication deficits and repetitive behaviors, but they just uh, are made up of differences um, in the way the brain processes information, pays attention, manages uh, emotions and emotionally regulates. Uh, coordinates information from different parts of the brain. And that happens in many different ways. 
so that different kids have different versions of autism depending on how this kind of coordination uh, takes place um, in that particular child that is in front of us. The other thing that we are learning is that there are certain um, other conditions that are not defined by social communication deficits and repetitive behaviors, typically genetic syndromes, that are much more likely to be associated with an autism diagnosis, suggesting that certain biologies that are predicted by genetic differences are associated with what we would call autism, right? And then we know that there are some kids who have what seems to be an unrelated condition, like congenital heart disease, for example, where the rates of autism are much higher in those kids than kids who don't have congenital heart disease. And how is one to understand that? Is it that the genetic predisposition that causes congenital heart disease is also likely to cause a neurodevelopmental difference like autism? Or is it that there are environmental factors that come from having congenital heart disease that can also cause biology that um, may produce something that looks like autism, like social deficits and repetitive behaviors, among many other things? All of this to say that the many different ways you can get an autism label are becoming more and more complex. And what we're calling autism is, um, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm getting a call from Erin Kids, and I don't know if it's coming from you guys or not. No, no, we can hear you just okay. fine. Um, uh, okay. You're, you're okay. doing well. Perfect, okay. So that's the problem with using my cell phone now. <laughs> you're gonna hear on my phone, uh, on my calls. Um, so, it, or is it possible, and is it possible that the conditions that we call autism include many more differences positive or negative, challenges or strengths that could be classified under the autism spectrum. So could I get the next slide, please? So I'm going to introduce you very quickly to the Lancet Commission, which was a, 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 an effort, a global effort with representation from uh, uh, countries around the world, from all continents, from clinicians, from scientists, from autistic individuals, and from families to uh, come up with um, a, a summary of our understandings for autism as it stands right now and uh, some future recommendations um, for, the, for the next few years. And I'll come back to it from time to time to link the understanding of the biology as we are figuring it out from research to some of these recommendations. So I'm gonna start with this one because it does get to this diversity of clinical presentation. The idea that um, there are some autism specific neurobiological differences and that's why we're looking at genes and brains and I'll get into that later. That there are some other neurodevelopmental differences that may be produced by the same biology or may happen to coexist with autism-related biology that actually um, interacts or, or speaks to the, the types of differences that we see. And there are some environmental factors like pregnancy complications or prematurity that we know increase the chance of the brain wiring in a different fashion that maybe to the original biological differences and presentations that we see within autism. But then as the kids grow up, we're starting to see as a result of all these biological differences, a variety of other symptoms like anxieties and phobias and ADHD and irritability. We see some unusual patterns of communication um, and, and which also lead to the kids actually experiencing the world in a different way. So then they're getting unusual experiences um, and those then interact with these symptoms of anxiety and ADHD and so on to, to lead to differences in the, way, in the way kids integrate in social environments, access school systems, and ultimately transition into, the, in, into adulthood. If you think of autism, the autism trajectory of a child in this way, you can see that 
it, it can go many, many different ways, right? Depending on the underlying biology, depending on the experiences that the child has in their family, in their school system, in their overall, in their community, you see that basically uh, it's possible to start from more shared biology and end up with very different outcomes or that kids start from very different places, but they still meet criteria for autism. Next slide, please. So to understand all of this complexity, because it's complex and it's hard, right? To understand all of this complexity, we break it down to differences in the original blueprint, our DNA, right? Differences on how this blueprint, the original DNA, impacts the brain and the body, so brain and body differences between kids with autism and across neurodevelopmental conditions, the experiences and the perspectives of people who identify as autistic and how those interact with the different bodies and the different brains that we have, and ultimately differences in how we respond, how we select interventions and how we respond to interventions. To make a sense of it, because for now, it just looks like autism is a um, situation where we have put together many, many, many different conditions. Some of that, some of them actually not even associated with impairment or distress, but they just share social deficits and repetitive behaviors. And it's hard for us to act on that because we have very different kids, very different brains, very different bodies, very different perspectives and, 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 and opinions. So I'm gonna go a little bit in a systematic fashion and tell you a little bit about where we are with diversity in the genomics, where we are with diversity in brains and bodies, in, in participant perspectives and in intervention. So my introductory slide for genomics here is to remind us all that, the, that there is enormous amount of diversity in the types of genetic changes that can still lead to social difficulties and repetitive behaviors. So we start, we used to think, and I apologize, I have no access to my screen now, so I cannot point, I'll have to walk you through the slides. But we used to think that, uh, that we would end up on the right side of that graph where we would have a lot of common traits that are just in the general population and they serve purposes that are very adaptive. Um, and are preserved by evolution. And when you get a certain combination of those traits, <clears throat> you would actually get a, an autism diagnosis. And it looks like, and, and we had also assumed that there would be a small number of genes that actually affect some of the circuitry that's uh, important for social deficits and repetitive behaviors that would explain the differences that we see in kids and in youth and in adults. Turns out we were totally wrong. Um, so that is not what the evidence supports right now. So it looks like that there are some genetic changes in about 15%, 15 to 20% of autistic people who uh, are extremely rare. So. Um, only a few people share the same genetic change, but when they get it, it has a very large effect, a very large impact on how the brain wires and leads to um, a variety of different um, uh, a variety of differences that uh, have to do with how we process the world, how we learn, how we put different pieces of information together, and social. Uh, is a, a domain where we have to put a lot of information together. And so if we have enough differences on how information gets integrated, put together, and put in context, then we're more likely to get social deficits. But most of these genetic um, differences lead to symptoms that have, go much beyond social, as we discussed before and as we know clinically, right? So they, they also would affect the way we attend and, and uh, the way we put uh, information together and we learn new information, our thinking skills and uh, our motor function and how we control our motor function and how we integrate it with sensory functions so the sensory motor symptoms that we see in these kids, but also how we integrate information about emotions um, and how we regulate them. 
So clinically, it makes a lot of sense that we have certain genetic variants that have very big effects, not very small effects like, like we expect with common traits, that when they happen, you get difficulties or differences depending on your perspective uh, across a variety of domains that goes much beyond what we think autism is. So next, next um, slide, please. <clears throat> so I didn't know if people see that. Yeah, that there, there were animations, so you may have to get all the way through to the animations here. So I was going to uh, give you an update so that from the Canadian data, with some combination and some collaboration with Americans and international colleagues, um, we just put out uh, a paper, this paper for those who are interested, uh, where we looked at 11,000 different genetic samples, a bit more than 11,000, and mapped all the types of genetic differences that we have seen in autism to date. Um, and that includes from really small little things uh, like uh, a small pieces of DNA missing, extra pieces of DNA, um, extra uh, 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 unusual number like a, 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 of a particular segment of DNA. So we call those copy number variations or even very big changes in the DNA where a whole part of a chromosome is missing or is duplicated. And we found 134 different um, genes that had such changes that actually impacted the diagnosis of autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. And we also found those in about 15% of kids with autism. Now, usually parents get really stressed when I tell them this, because if we have at least a disorders, how are we going to think about how we're going to help these kids? Um, like the amount of expertise required to master to master 134 disorders would be, uh, it sounds like a lot, and it is. So what is on the right side of my slide is an effort to group these different genes in pathways in the brain and the body that we can then potentially target with intervention. So we don't have to think of those 134 as 134 different conditions, we can think that those 134 map out to about six to seven pathways. And some of them, we are particularly actually good at both understanding what they do to our brain and our body, um, and also potentially um, have uh, the ability to manipulate it in a way that produces benefit. So you can show me one more slide and then we can take questions because I see a break, uh, I see the comment on the side. So um, this was my summary of genetic diversity because it's important to understand. And people often ask us why we do genetic work. We do genetic work because we are trying to understand what differences in the original blueprint, our human blueprint, right? The one that makes us, that predicts how we become human, cause differences that may impact um, our lives in ways that are not favorable, that people may want to think about interventions and treatments for. And then whether a child has a gene difference or not, if we understand those pathways, those body and brain differences, we can target those to actually produce um, changes that are favorable or desired by the autistic person themselves. The other thing to, that is important to remember is that we only found these differences in about 14 to 15 people, a percent of people, right? So genomics on its own is not adequate. It's important for us to understand what these pathways are, but it's not adequate on its own for us to give individualized, personalized recommendations to the person that's in front of us because we do not know, the majority of the kids, we would not know what their genetic difference is. And for that reason, we have to look at how these genetic differences impact brain structure and function, our body systems, like our gut and our immune system. Um, and uh, there was a specific question about epigenetics, so also um, understanding how these genes actually translate themselves in our body to create proteins that are the building blocks of our body. So if we had markers on epigenetics, on body systems, on brain structure and function, 
we may not need to know the exact genetic variant that a child has um, in order to provide personalized help and support. So that's where we are now with genetics, the mapping of the pathways and their impact on brain structure, body systems, um, and um, uh, kind of individualized organs and other uh, pre um, uh, parts of our bodies that may serve as markers. So I don't know if I should take questions now uh, because I can, I can decipher the presenter chat, chat by the best or whether I should continue. Well, you know what? I'm going to step in here um, for uh, for everyone real quick because we've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, we're not going to be able to get to all of them uh, today just due to, to time constraints. But one that, you know, uh, people are, are looking to to understand here is can you speak to the overlap between ADHD and autism? Yes. So I'm going to start responding to that question right now. And then when I show you the brain data, it will become even more obvious. Okay. But, so so the, the, the basic, the, the idea of an overlap comes from the idea that these are two distinct disorders, one defined by social deficits and repetitive behaviors, the other one defined by hyperactivity and impulsivity and attention. And so when we, both, when we see kids who have both, we are assuming they have two disorders, right? And there is a very high overlap in autism for ADHD. So as I said before, depending on the study, between 30 to 50% of kids will meet full criteria for ADHD, and many more will have just impairing symptoms. The opposite, by the way, is true, right? So we forget that. So kids with ADHD, usually people only care about impulsivity and attention and um, hyperactivity. But in fact, when we look at kids with ADHD and bother to look at their social function, at least 15 to 20% of them have significant social impairment. Now, what happens when we see kids uh, have um, so many, um, uh, th 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 be so likely to actually um, have overlap. Um, one way is to say that this is an incredibly unlikely group of kids that are getting two disorders, but there's too many of those for that to be uh, likely true. Most likely, the way we define these conditions is wrong, and as I said before. So most likely we have a series of bio biological conditions, whether you define them by genetics or by brain imaging, that make it likely that the kid, as they grow up, they will experience some challenges in social communication, but also in attention and in hyperactivity and in impulsivity. That is the condition that the child has. The child has one brain, doesn't have multiple brains, one for autism, one for ADHD. They have one brain with one difference, that particular difference makes it more likely that they will have difficulties on all of those domains. But because we usually make the diagnosis of autism earlier, because we can assess social communication a little bit earlier than we can assess attention and impulsivity, because all toddlers are inattentive and impulsive by definition, um, people assume that these are conditions that they just start accumulating. So if you allow me for that question, I will show you the brain data that actually makes the point that the brain doesn't see autism, the brain doesn't see ADHD, the brain sees areas of difficulty, areas of strength, and those are not separating in the brain the way we think diagnostic labels separate. Okay, thank you so much for that. So um, we have about 20 minutes left. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw it over to you to just Go through the content as you would. I'm going to step back in towards the um, towards the end there, just for those of our audience that need to leave um, and give them some instruction. For now, I'll throw it back to you. As a reminder, we're currently on uh, the summary of genetic diversity. I believe we should probably move to the next slide. Yep, and, and I will uh, I will actually skip a few to discover the the majority of the topics so that I, I give people an idea. Perfect. So, All right. Just let me know what slides you want me to go to. I'll be in the background, making sure the audience sees the right ones. Okay, so we're in the right slide right now. So as we talked about before, um, just understanding genomics is not enough. We need to understand what these differences in the blueprints 
uh, how these differences on the blueprint affect our thinking skills, our behavior, um, our brain structure and function, our immune systems, our hormones, um, our guts, and so on. So most of the data I'm going to show you is from a Canadian network called the Pond Network, which has been going on for 10 years. Some of you have seen previous data from this network, but basically what we're trying to say is if our diagnostic labels are not serving to tell us which exact version of neurodivergence or the neurodiversity, depending on your perspective, uh, a child has that's in front of us, can we use information from biology and behavior and treatment response to understand what the real subgroups are so that we can have a better idea of what the trajectory, what the expectations are for a child who's in front of us and where the opportunities for intervention are. The next slide, in fact, you can go to slides, you can go to 10. So in slide 10, if you can move it, okay. So in slide 10, you will notice that this is an effort where we put all the scans, the brain scans of kids who have autism, ADHD, OCD, and a few kids who are typically developing together. And we ask machine learning approaches, artificial intelligence approaches, to help us figure out what the different groups of kids are who have more similar brains. In this case, we're looking at brain structure. So I want you to look at the right upper corner and ignore everything else for the sake of this right now because you're gonna see 10 groups and each group has columns in blue, purple, green, and yellow. And um, purple is autism, kids who, who identify as autistic, blue are ADHD, green is OCD, and yellow are typically developing kids who have present with no concerns. So when we ask the algorithm to tell us how many different kinds of brains in terms of structure they were there, in that case, there were 10 different groups. Now, if you look at the groups, you will realize that only number 10 is autism specific. So six, seven, eight, nine is made up uh, of groups of kids who have either autism or ADHD or OCD. So basically kids with different diagnosis are more likely to have similar brains than kids who have one diagnosis, which is autism in purple. So you'll see purple was in all 10 clusters. So there were autistic kids that, whose brains um, were classified in all 10 clusters, but um, there, was, there were kids who did not have autism who had brains much more similar to kids with autism than not. If you go to the next slide, so this basically tells us that the brain doesn't necessarily, in terms of its structure, does not necessarily understand what we mean by autism as a definition, as a condition. So the next question was, well, maybe it's not in the structure, but it's in the function. And so the next study I'm gonna show you is about functional connectivity, how different parts of the brain actually talk to each other, how efficient they talk to each other, and so on. And I'm gonna ask you to go to two slides down, um, to slide 13. And so when we looked at functional connectivity, we found two different types of brains uh, among kids with autism, ADHD, OCD, and typically developing kids, two different clusters. And so if you look at the top where it says cluster one and cluster two, uh, you'll see that none of these clusters was autism specific. So we found the cluster that includes about half the kids with autism three quarters the kids of ADHD, 20% uh, 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 of kids with OCD, and even some controls for their functional connectivity, and another cluster that has the other half of kids with autism, with a quarter of the kids with ADHD, um, half of the kids, um, the majority of the kids with OCD and some controls. Again, to tell us that some of these kids are predicted, they have a brain that predicts this com what we call comorbidity. They have a condition, whatever we call it, that starts with autism, and as they grow, they're more or less likely to get either ADHD or OCD and a variety of other conditions if we look. If you go to the next slide, this is an effort that uh, was, has been made in the last year 
to uh, compare the Canadian data to American data to make sure that when we look at these things, it's not some random thing of the kids that we have in our sample, but that we can replicate it in a completely independent sample in a different country. And if you go to the next slide, and I think it had, um, there we go. Again, it looks complicated, but uh, I, I will make a point. You don't have to worry about the, the extra stuff uh, since I cannot point my, my pointer now. <laughs> But on the left side, it's phone, which is a Canadian kid. And on the right side, it's HPN, which is a New York kid. And we asked the machine learning algorithm to split the cluster of all the kids into two groupings. And this is based, again, on the strength of functional connectivity in the brain, how connected the different parts of the brain are, into two groupings that, that are more similar to each other. And then we looked at what predicts these two groupings when we use machine learning and supervised clustering methods. And the first thing that we saw was IQ. So it was cognition and thinking skills. So the first grouping did not separate the diagnosis. It just separated the, the thinking skills of the kids. And then the second grouping, when we asked it, asked it to actually split one, the larger cluster from, the, from that step into another two groupings, it actually, they were different in ADHD symptoms. So the brain understands thinking skills, cognitive abilities, the brain understands ADHD symptoms. There was no difference in the diagnosis that the kids had between the different clusters. Now, if you get me to the next slide, the, if you look much lower down, you see that it takes quite a few splits because, before we can start the diagnosis popping up as potentially being different between groups. And it takes almost to the last step here to even pick up autism or social deficits as something that the brain understands as a big thing, as something that distinguishes groups, uh, kids from each other. And if you show me the next slide, I'll make one more point on this. Um, uh, and it's uh, the, the graph on the right and the little arrow the other thing that was surprising is that we did find a, a sampling of socioeconomic status on the brain, on functional connectivity. So for all the genomic influences to the brain, there are many other environmental uh, influences to the brain that impact the structure and the function of the brain much more than whether we think somebody has a diagnosis of autism or ADHD. So to summarize this, basically when we use the brain rather than the diagnostic labels, whether we use the structure, what are the different groups, what are the different autisms and what are the different neurodevelopmental groups that are under kids, uh, that, that, that characterize the neurodivergent kids? We are learning that the brain understands that there are kids who have a variety of cognitive abilities and thinking skills. The brain does understand that there are kids who have significant difficulties with attention and impulsivity and hyperactivity. The brain understands repetitive behaviors, especially those that are more consistent with obsessive compulsive disorder rather than autism, but it gets into the details when the brain tries to predict social function. So us defining these conditions just by social function is not mapping to something that the brain or biology understands. And why is this important? It's important because it, we have used those criteria to prioritize intervention targets. But if the target, if, if, if the primary differences that you give rise to things like social differences are not social, but they're about how we learn, how we put together information, how we attend, how we organize our thoughts, uh, how we stop ourselves when we need to stop, then one could make the argument that these are potentially better targets for intervention. So I'm going to ask you now to skip to slide 21. And maybe, maybe 22. Because I want to say something about the diversity of partner experiences. So, so far we're learning there are many different biological versions of autism, whether you look at genetics or whether you look at brains. 
And we're also learning that they're not special to autism. They overlap with other conditions, which would explain why our kids have such high levels of comorbidity. It's because it's one condition, like the, the, the kids who uh, get autism first and then ADHD, they probably have a condition that predicts all of that. But we know that there is also a lot of diversity in the views and the wants and the needs uh, and the experiences of autistic people. And so if you go to the next slide, we attempted a few years back to learn as we ran a large Canadian effort, well, mostly Ontarian effort, to understand the research priorities of neurodivergent children and youth and some adults um, using a very standard, methodologically robust um, way of uh, developing priorities over a two-year period. And these were the top 10 priorities that the uh, families and the kids and those who care for them um, finally came up with. Um, it is not as important for you to see all of them now, but the, it is important to know that when we think about the diversity of views, the priorities ultimately uh, were um, some around precision and personalized health, so what and for whom and when, um, when we make decisions about interventions. There were some that were around system navigation and supporting families, which we rarely talk about in, in research talks. And then the domains that were prioritized were emotion regulation, anxiety, uh, irritability, self-injury, and only at number 10, social. So it's important for us to think about that although we define some of these things as socially repetitive, the brain doesn't seem to get it, the genes don't, doesn't seem to get it, and even our, our partners who have the lived experience do not prioritize it over other things like emotion regulation and anxiety, mental health domains that seem to be more important um, to them. The next slide also very quickly to say that how we prioritize and how we think about autism is culturally defined. So the only reason I put that slide there is because the UK and Canada use the exact same methodology to come up with priorities. And although some of the priorities overlap like mental health and, and supporting families and navigation, a lot do not. So some of the priorities of autistic people and the divergence of opinions is culturally defined and it needs to be local and it needs to speak to the experiences locally. So now if you skip to 26, I was going to say just a tiny bit about interventions. Uh, no, I had to slide on your diversity, but maybe we can take that as a question at the end um, because um, the, so the, the, the variety of opinions, well, I'll say two things. Um, the variety of opinions is not just on what people find a challenge and what they find just a difference, what they want help with and what they don't want help with, but it also varies based on whether people believe that uh, autism uh, as defined is a condition that's associated with challenges and impairment or not. And that probably comes from the different perspectives that come from the different experiences of the different autisms that, that exist within the spectrum. So, uh, and I don't wanna simplify that because that can get pretty complicated and I'm happy to take questions after, but, but there are people who have not experienced impairment from core symptom domains at all. And of course they would never prioritize core symptom domains for intervention, where there are people who find Social, uh, the, the inability to socially integrate a traumatic experience and they line up for trials to get interventions for um, uh, sociability, for example. There are people who see the, the, the strengths that come from this un, uh, uh, atypical or unusual or different wiring of the brain and the, the benefits outweigh the, the, the risks. Well, for others, the experience of the um, attention and the social and some of the rigidity is so devastating that uh, they do not believe that the strengths that weigh the, the difficulties or the challenges they experience. But neurodiversity refers 
to all the different brains that we all have. They, it does not just be, uh, refer to people who are neurodivergent, who are a bit difficult from what's expected, if you like, in the typical range, because that's a cultural decision, what's typical and what's not, what's not typical. Neurodiversity is the idea that we all have different brains. They all come with strengths and weaknesses. Understanding people's needs and meeting them at what they are, where they are is probably the better way forward. And now we're learning that biology, whether it's genetics or brains, would support that idea. It would support that the biological differences do not produce labels, but they produce patterns that are different among brains, and people will perceive those differences in various ways, and our job is to meet them where they need us to meet them. Um, so if you skip a slide, uh, if you get to number 29, I was going to give you a couple of examples for those who are actually interested in therapeutics and they're interested after to uh, understand whether some of the biological differences um, can be manipulated to produce benefit, um, then uh, we do have a series of clinical trials now and medications that are targeting these underlying pathways um, that uh, are promising in terms of producing benefits for attention and for irritability and for hyperactivity, and sometimes for social, but much more um, uh, heterogeneous of various types of responses when it comes to social. I see a comment about uh, needing to move to questions. So I can stop and move to questions, and if people stay a bit longer, I can finish with the slide. Great. So as well, I was going to ask um, if you could stay just a little bit longer. I know that we're, we're losing uh, some of you, so we're going to we are going to go over today um, just to uh, make sure that um, we get through we get through all of this and all of this will be available on demand on the Autism Ontario website um, a little bit later on, uh, probably early uh, uh, late this week, early next week. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time um, or or not. Remember, share this URL, anyone who, who you think might benefit from this research. It's free to everyone. And the more people that come through, the more people that we, the more of these webinars um, that we can do. <clears throat> All right. So with that, I'm going to ask one question. And then we're, I, I do want to make sure that we get through, get through the content that, uh, that we had here. Um, so um, <clears throat> there was a question we, we, we talked about. ADHD, um, ADHD. Um, are we seeing similar um, uh, data around anxiety and autism? Are those two items uh, being seen from the uh, uh, comorbidities perspective? Yes, so anxiety is a, an interesting one. So anxiety, it can be many different things uh, to many different people. Um, so we, in, if we just look at symptoms of anxiety in kids and youth with ASD, depending at what age we look, the comorbidity is very high. So up to 50% of teenagers will uh, be close to meeting an anxiety disorder criteria, depending on the study. And if we just look at anxiety symptoms that cause some impairment, even if they don't meet criteria for an anxiety disorder, some studies would say that for the teenagers, it's up to 80%, right? So the reason anxiety though is a bit different than ADHD is because you can assume that for some kids, the story is the same as ADHD. They have a biological difference that predicts that they will develop autism and later on anxiety because that's the kind of uh, difference that they have in the brain. For some other kids though, a lot of the things, a lot of the experience of the world is not a positive experience. So you can actually envision that somebody who started with not a particularly anxious temperament, but got massively rejected, experienced a lot of rejections and trauma, developed anxiety later on uh, as they grow up as an experience of the world. Of course, there would be a signature of that on our brain if we were able to pull them apart. Right, so we, we said that the environmental things, our life experiences leave a signature on our brain, but they may not necessarily have started as a predicted condition, 
by the biology, but maybe something that we did um, uh, as part of the gene by environment interaction. Like the environment may have caused trauma and distress enough, an experience of rejection enough that some of these kids develop anxiety phenotypes. And in fact, we, ha we cannot know that this is true because a lot of the anxiety, some of the anxiety that kids, kids with autism, autistic kids experience is very similar to what typically developing kids experience. But we have this extra category, which is called anxiety NYD, so not yet diagnosed or not yet specified, which are kids who have anxiety that, but doesn't quite fit in any of the boxes that we see in the typically developing kids. And some of that may be because some of the anxiety is part of the autism, and that's why it's different. And some of that may be that this is the anxiety that, that the anxiety symptoms that have been caused or have been contributed to by this, the world that we have built for them. And that's something very to take very seriously. Excellent. Um, maybe I'll get to this a little bit later, but um, do you have any recommendations for supporting children and youth with co comorbid diagnoses? Yeah, so, so this is a very good question. And I don't have a very good answer, but I'll give you the honest answer. So I'll tell you exactly what we do right now, but what the future state should hold. So what we say now for kids who have co-occurring conditions is that they deserve to get the therapies and interventions that kids who would have those conditions without having autism would get. So we want kids to be able to get accommodations for ADHD like any other kid who has ADHD. We use the same medications for ADHD in kids who, have, uh, who are on the autism spectrum uh, uh, as compared to kids who just have ADHD. We want kids to have access to mental health like any other child. So any kid who has anxiety should get anxiety treatment. We have adapted some of the anxiety treatments to kids with autism, but if you live in an area where you do not have access to adaptive treatments, we want kids who can participate in traditional mental health interventions to be eligible and to participate and to not be excluded. This is what we do now based on what we have now. So our recommendation is we don't call everything autism right now because basically kids end up not getting services for their mental health needs or for their ADHD symptoms and so on. But future state <laughs> where we want to get is this idea of personalized recommendations. So if we know that a child is on a biological pathway that predicts that they will get emotion regulation in three years and they are likely to get anxiety by the time that they are 12 years old, we wanna get to a place where we can develop this uh, treatment pathways that are tailored to the child that we have in front of us, some of it with anticipatory guidance because we know that we're expecting something to happen or something is likely to happen, and with some understanding of the underlying biology. Um, and I'll show you for those who stay in a second that sometimes when we target the underlying biology, we get the benefits in this comor what people think are comorbid conditions, but in fact, they're probably part of the type of autism that the child has. Excellent. Okay. At this point, it looks like we've got those who can stay or staying on. Um, we got about 10 more minutes uh, left okay. in, in total. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw it over to you to go through those slides and I will come back in at the end. Okay, perfect. So let's get to the next slide because that would be an example of this. So some of the genes that we have identified that I showed you previously uh, as a cluster get to the synaptic space. That's the communication space between two different nerve cells or two neurons in the brain. So the question was, are there any medications that kind of manipulate how easily, how, how best to get a signal from one neuron to another if we have imbalances on the amount of excitation in the brain and the amount of kind of calm, calming chemicals in the brain? The problem with high excitation versus calming um, in the brain, we call it excitation inhibition, is that it creates a very noisy brain. So the information is processed, but the information is drowned in noise. So the question was, did we have any medications that can work on that mechanism? And it turns out there are a few of those. 
And I'll show you an example here with Rilazole, a drug that was approved for ALS, nothing to do with autism. It's not even used uh, for autism, for, for um, a brain condition. In the case of ALS, it's used for its peripheral effects, not for its brain effects but it's, it fits the mechanism. And so the question was, if we won't go after the biology, will we get benefits? So if you can show me the next slide. We treated um, 60 kids, half with drug and half with placebo. And in the first slide, you'll see the blue line being realizol and the, green, the red line being placebo. And we are looking at reduction, how much we can reduce social withdrawal. <coughs> And we treated kids over 12 weeks, and then we tested them again at the end, four weeks after we had stopped the medicine. And you'll see that there is a pattern for the kids who took Rilazol to have more reduction in social withdrawal than kids who received placebo. But now if you get to the next slide, <clears throat> you will see that the we also looked at this, what people call comorbid conditions, so in this case, irritability and hyperactivity, things that are prioritized by our stakeholders in the prioritization exercise. And when we treated biology and not the label, we actually got much better results for irritability and hyperactivity with significant reduction in the blue line compared to the red line uh, in hyperactivity and in irritability. So that would suggest that when you treat the underlying condition, that the biology that you think is underlying the autism diagnosis for the kids in front of you, you will get effects that are actually uh, widespread because the biology doesn't just predict the autism label, but all these comorbid symptoms. And it will be different for different kids because different kids will have different biology. But on average, <coughs> you get gains in domains that go much beyond social and repetitive behaviors. I have another example in the next slide, but I will skip it so I can tell you a bit more, and I'll ask you to move to, uh, to slide 36. But people can, people can see it quickly if they want to. So uh, this is the story of oxytocin, and I know lots of people are excited about oxytocin, and I want to put a warning that the large studies that looked at just uh, giving oxytocin to people have not shown benefit on social function. But I do want to show you what they have changed as show benefit for. So in the next slide, you'll see that um, the, the, um, the, in the first uh, two graphs, uh, basically, uh, I'll, I'll just walk you through since I can show you, but basically there is improvement in the ability of the kids to identify emotions and other states when they look at pictures of people but we, which we know it to be a primary cognitive thinking process related to social function. But when we looked at social function, we found nothing. But then when we looked at, on the right side of this slide, at quality of life, if you look at the first two columns, emotional functioning and social functioning, in purple, you have oxytocin, and in green, you have placebo, sugar pill, and the, the solid lines is what happened when the kids were taking the medicine, and the dotted lines is when we stopped the medicine. So for the first one, you'll see an, a, a being above zero means you had gain. So you'll see that the kids who got oxytocin, their quality of life when it comes to emotional functioning had much greater gains than what the sugar pill did. And even when we remove the drugs with the dotted lines, we maintain some of that effect. Social functioning, not, not actual social functioning, but quality of life related to social functioning. So the ability to get pleasure and joy out of social interactions. When we put kids on oxytocin, they gain much more compared to placebo, um, although the effect disappeared when we removed the drug. So what are we to make of that, right? So we are improving their quality of life. We are improving the primary thinking process but this obsession we have with sociability, um, we see no effect. It gets to this idea that potentially this social complicated domain that we have used to define autism is getting us a little bit into trouble again. So the, the biology doesn't map to it, change in the biology, 
does not make a big difference to it? And is it really important if it was prioritized number 10 among the priorities by our stakeholders? Now, the next one, I'm gonna make you skip to slide 40 because I wanna say a word about intervention and what we mean by intervention. Typically, when we talk about intervention, we talk about things that we do to a specific child, to a specific adult. It's a very targeted uh, manipulation, if you like. But I'm gonna use the example of what happened during COVID. So we tracked the mental health of autistic kids uh, in a large cohort uh, in Ontario during COVID. And we identified three clusters. The first one that you will see that says N141 is a cluster of kids whose mental health, no matter what you measured, went down. They deteriorated. Then we had the second cluster that says N of 89, that were kids who actually maintained their mental health. And then we had a little small cluster who kids who actually, whose actual mental health thrived in Ontario. And then we looked at what predicted the deteriorating mental health in the first cluster. And it was pre-existing mental health, which makes sense. If the kids started with a lot of difficulty, of course they had trouble. But the other things were parental mental health, material deprivation, and loss of school and medical services. You'll see there's no social there. There is no core symptom domain there. What we saw is that parents not doing well, people not having food security and financial security, and not having access to their usual network is what predicted deterioration of mental health. So if you were to put an intervention to actually protect the mental health of autistic kids, would you have put it on all the medications and all the biology that I just showed you? Not that that's not important, but would you have put it on public health and, and, and kind of global initiatives that support parents, assure food security, and make sure that their schools and their services don't close? It's something to challenge us to think about how we think about intervention and what predicts the different responses we see and the different trajectories in mental health among kids. It's not always what we did as an intervention. It's not always the original biology. Some of these things are the socioeconomic of, of wellness that we tend to think about and they may have even a larger impact in the outcomes of kids than the very individualized, personalized things that we do. So if I, do I have time to show something else or am I done? <laughs> We got a little bit of time. Um, some some people are asking if we could talk a little bit about next steps. So maybe if, if you, you can move me to the next steps, maybe. Yeah. I have a next step slide, which is slide. Well, yeah. Let's see where am I am. Um, I think it's slide forty nine. Perfect. Okay. So let's talk a bit about next steps. So in slide fifty. Um, I will put, I have put in the, if you can move to slide 50, I have put in the recommendations from the Lancet Commission about what they think, what this global consensus community thinks is the, um, the next steps. And um, but this is a document I'm happy to share, but in, these are global recommendations. So some of them don't feel as relevant as others, but frankly, they are all uh, likely quite relevant. So one, uh, there are some global recommendations for next steps, things like if you don't know who has autism, then you don't know what are the diversities in autism are and you cannot meet their needs. So they put a comment there that for parts of the world, there are no numbers about who has autism and who doesn't. But I would argue Canada does not have an epidemiological study to capture all the kids with autism and, and how they grow to understand what the different trajectories are and what the different needs are. So that was the first recommendation. The second one has to do with intervention and it talks about a step care and personalized health model. Um, basically, we talked quite a bit about, about personalized health already, trying to tailor the recommendations to the kids' biology, but also socioeconomic and other things that leave a signature on their brain and support them at where they are. Um, but the step here we haven't talked about, which is 
from less restrictive and less cumbersome to most restrictive. And that's something we get wrong also. So because we are so obsessing about these core symptom domains and moving those core symptom domains, we forget that kids learn on a variety of environments. Some kids learn better than others in those environments. So starting from the least restric restrictive and least kind of uh, pre-specified, if you like, um, and rigid uh, way of intervention and normally escalating to the very rigid, very intensive when the kids are feeling more naturalistic approaches is a recommendation. The third one is about personalized treatment plans. We talked about those. It highlights strengths and difficulties. The next one is about the co-occurring conditions. So we did talk about those um, in, sense of, in a sense that I, you can think of them as co-occurring, but you can also think of them as part of your child's condition. And you need to intervene on those the same way that you would intervene um, for kids who do not have autism and have these conditions until we have solutions to tell you that if you have the combination, in fact, you have a different condition and this is the right path. So kids should not be deprived of traditional mental health uh, and physical health interventions just because they have autism. The next one is the personalization one. So what interventions work for whom, when, and how? Um, and so we're doing quite a bit of work on that and I'll show you in a, in a second. Um, they talked about doing um, infrastructure, developing some infrastructure to compare all the different potentially good interventions and treatments that exist to each other and understand which groups are a best fit for which intervention. And lastly, to monitor the access to intervention. If we do not know who's receiving intervention, we don't know who's not receiving intervention, and we know that we have significant gaps in equity, which are not just about social justice, which is probably the most important thing, of course, but it is about us understanding this diversity of needs and opinions uh, that underlie autism and neurodevelopmental conditions. Now, very specifically, if you go to the next slide, because I told you a lot about personalized health information, uh, personalized pathways, um, we uh, are working uh, in a translational way. So we have put the human genomic variants into animal models to understand the impact of those variants on, on brain development. And now we are developing groups based on uh, these brain signatures that we think uh, we know what the biology of is. Specific brain and body signatures to see if we can improve um, the things that people care about by targeting these underlying brain and body signatures. The second thing that we are doing for the next slide between the European Autism Consortium and the Canadian, uh, the Pond Consortium in Canada to actually do two things. One, when we are testing interventions that require large numbers to collaborate and, and, and run studies uh, with autistic kids, both in Europe and in, um, in Canada together and merge our data. Secondly, when we need large samples to understand predictors or biomarkers, things that predict who is likely to respond to what intervention, where definitive answers. And if you go to the next slide, we, conti we have continuous engagement with families and those with lived experience to understand a little bit this debate about what needs to be changed. Because I hope you got from this talk that all this obsession with sociability and repetitive behavior, sometimes it's right for some kids and some youth and some adults and for others it's not. So what we are trying to understand is how neurodivergent people, including autistic people, envision a good life. What are the predictors of the, that good life? What actually helps you and uh, uh, have the life that you have envisioned as good, and then start tailoring our interventions, whether they're biological or other, to these things that predict the vision of a good life. Um, 
ideas about neurodiversity keep evolving, so we're staying in the middle of this. Uh, we would love to have your thoughts and, and your support because it is a hard conversation. And then if you can show me quickly the next two slides, and that, that would be my last two ones, and they're quick. Um, the, we commit, we understand that these um, questions are very complex, that the space have become very complex. Like we said to tell you that the more we understand about autism, the easier it gets. But in fact, the more we understand about autism, the harder it gets. And we know it will take these very large collaborations, but also people with other minds and other thoughts and other ideas to explore the data to help with understanding. So what we are doing is in this slide, we are federating our data with other very large consortia and, and institutions to allow investi other investigators from around the world to actually um, check our data, interrogate, ask questions of our data. And in the next slide, we're actually releasing our data to the public domain. It has to be a researcher who requests the data, but if a researcher were to request the data, that we don't even have to give consent. We're just releasing it for ethical research um, by other people to have as many thoughts and as many brains think about this very complex problem. So in my next slide, I'm thanking uh, the families uh, who participate in research because honestly, if, you don't, if the families don't participate, we do not get a sense of where these differences are coming from and how many of those we have and so on. It also takes a village of investigators and trainees and clinicians and collaborators and families who are co-applicants with us in a lot of the grants. And you see a picture here and, a, and a, on the next slide, you see uh, the names of many, but not all including Autism Ontario, that's a, a partner for the Ontario, for the Pont Network in Ontario, um, to help us think through the complexity of these issues. So I'll stop and I'm okay to actually take questions if, if it's allowed or, or not. Well, unfortunately right now we, we have run out of time. I, I wanna thank you so much for what was an incredible presentation under challenging circumstances with the tech issues off the top, but we got through it. And um, and I know that there was a bunch of questions that weren't answered. So, you know, potentially we'll have you back for another session or maybe there'll be another mechanism by which we can we can address that. So um, that's all the time we got, folks. Um, thank you so much um, for all of you who stayed late. I want to thank everyone for their participation and we look forward to seeing you on our next Autism Ontario event.